Welcome to today's Postgres World webinar, Yugabyte DB Distributed PostgreSQL, Why and How. We're joined by Frank Pashu, developer advocate at Yugabyte, who will talk all things Yugabyte and answer questions like why another database instead of an extension? When can Yugabyte be substituted for standard Postgres and why? What is Yugabyte not a good choice? And Postgres is the best fit. I love that you're going to get into that. And what is distributed versus sharded when it comes to scale out? My name is Lindsay Hooper. I'm one of the Postgres conference organizers, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. So a little bit about your speaker. Like I said, Frank is a developer advocate for Yugabyte, a PostgreSQL compatible open source distributed SQL database. He's also Oracle ACE Director, Oracle Certified Master, AWS Data Hero, and an Oaktable member. So with that, I'm going to hand it off. Take it away. Thank you, Lindsay. Yeah, so you introduced uh, the topic. I will be quick on, on, on the intro. I'm developer advocate for Yugabyte. It's a distributed SQL database. I will explain what it is, but especially because it's Postgres compatible and we are in a Postgres conference, uh, I will focus on the differences and, 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 and the similarities with Postgres, what is similar to Postgres, what is uh, different. And also, we, we can go into the detail uh, about how it was built with part of Postgres and part of new development. And if there are any questions uh, during the talk, then then uh, do not hesitate to uh, to ask them. Uh, I can adapt the content to 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 your questions as well. So about myself, the most important is that you can reach me on Twitter on uh, or, or by email. But I'm a lot on uh, on Twitter, but I'm also easy to find on uh, on LinkedIn. So do not hesitate if you have any question later. And uh, I, I will start directly about why Postgres compatibility for a new database and uh, something that probably everybody has seen in the past years, the Postgres popularity. So this is uh, the database ranking engine, which is based on popularity in social media, Stack Overflow question, etc. Basically, we see the old databases uh at the top uh, but not growing anymore and some are growing especially postgres is really growing in popularity uh more and more and uh i've also put a few of the distributed sql databases those who started with spanner and uh cockroach db tidb yugabyte db knowing that most of them are going to Postgres compatibility, except TIDB, which is more MySQL compatibility. So basically, Postgres is a popular database. And I would say the most popular for OLTP, because we don't need to forget that uh, MySQL is still very popular and still growing. But we see more Postgres when it comes to LTP. To, to, to complex uh, application, complex queries, uh, joins, foreign keys, constraints, etc. And uh, also Postgres is the, if we compare with MySQL, so the two open source databases that are very popular, uh, Postgres really follows the SQL standard where MySQL doesn't. And this is also important because besides being Postgres, if you follow the SQL standard, the gap with other databases is minimal. So we cannot say it's the best open source database, but it's probably the most popular for LTP and the best when you want SQL compatibility. And Postgres has a lot of features built in, but also with the extensibility uh, provided by Postgres where people can add many extensions uh, so yeah, this is about the popularity and, and then it makes sense. I will explain later how Yugabyte uh, started, but it really makes sense to follow Postgres compatibility today when you build a new database. And this is not only when building databases, it's also what we see with um, the cloud managed services. Uh, I, I've put just four pictures. You, you, 
you can see the colors for uh, AWS, for Google, for Azure, and uh, even Oracle is now um, talking about a Postgres compatible service on their cloud. Basically, all cloud vendors now have realized that they need to go to Postgres compatibility and propose many managed services that are more or less compatible with Postgres. For example, AWS uh, started with uh, RDS, where you can run Postgres, which is very similar to the community Postgres. And they have also Aurora, which is a bit different uh, in, in the storage, but still very compatible. Google has the same kind of offers. Cloud SQL is mostly the same as the community Postgres. Although EDB is more like Aurora in AWS. And Google Span uh, started as a distributed SQL database with very limited SQL. And now they are going to Postgres compatibility more and more, adding features that are Postgres compatible. And uh, Azure also, they renamed it uh, different time, it was called Hyperscale. It's now called Cosmo DB for Postgres, but they also have multiple um, services based on Postgres. And even Oracle has announced a Postgres uh, service, which is not yet there, but it shows that even uh, a database company like Oracle uh, realize that they need to provide a Postgres managed service. So. Why being Postgres compatible? There are mainly two, two big reasons. Uh, the, the first is the familiarity for, for users. And uh, I will take the, uh, just an example. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it's large enough, but if you, we build a new database with Yugabyte. And if people search for something like uh, how to find the first row for each group by, that's the kind of question we can find on, on Stack Overflow for a SQL database. If you search that on Yugabyte with the Yugabyte DB tag, you have no risk because Yugabyte is quite recent and there are not a lot of questions. But if you search the same with Postgres, then you have a lot of results. And I took the example there with the, uh, the most voted uh, question. So that's the first reason being Postgres compatible. The first reason is the familiarity where people uh, can use the knowledge they have or the knowledge base in Stack Overflow or blogs or anything. Everything that is about SQL, because it is Postgres compatible, you have the same answers for one and the other. And maybe I can show you. So this is the, the Stack Overflow page about this question for Postgres. And I've seen they even show um, an example in DB Fiddle uh, where you can run examples like you run the test case and you see it. And this is Postgres 13, because at the time the question was, uh, was there, uh, it was 13. You can see the same in 15. And you have also Yugabyte. So DB Fidel is not uh, yet with the latest versions of Yugabyte. And, and this one is a bit uh, longer to start because it starts in a container. But basically, you can verify that exactly the same SQL uh, DDL and DML, that was the answer for this Stack Overflow question, is exactly the same running on the on it. Okay, and uh, let me just go back here. Uh, so the familiarity of it. Before being compatible to run application, being familiar, not having to learn a new language, that's something important. And this is why people are going to uh, Postgres compatibility. Familiarity with the syntax, but also all the ecosystem and tools. When you have a tool or a framework that uh, is compatible with the Postgres dialect, then probably it will work on all Postgres compatible databases like Yugabyte. And we benefit from it every day. For example, when there is something new, a new tool or new application for Postgres, just try it on Yugabyte and that works. And the second reason for compatibility 
is uh, portability. If you already have an application running on Postgres and you want to test how it works on a scale out database like Hugabyte DB, you can just change the connection string. And because it is compatible, the protocol, the syntax, the query, the behavior is compatible, then it's easy to migrate. Migrate or simply test it. Uh, and in, in, in both ways, you can also start to go on Yugabyte and then finally realize that this is not what you wanted. Uh, you don't want to, the, uh, uh, to distribute, you don't want to scale out and want to go back to, to Postgres. This works in both ways. And between Postgres and Yugabyte, because it's compatible, but also when you come with from another database, um, it's quite similar uh, because it's the SQL standard and also uh, Postgres is very similar to Oracle in some, uh, some behavior. So those are the, the two big reasons for, for the compatibility. And then a question can be uh, why being just compatible? Why forking Postgres? I will explain the architecture, Yugabyte, is a, uses a fork of Postgres and adds a different storage to it. And a fork means that when we want to follow the Postgres versions for the compatibility for the new features, then you have, we have to merge it. So why forking and not just using Postgres or adding an extension to Postgres? Um, it's quite difficult currently because Distributed database is very different from a monolithic one. And even if Postgres is very extensible with extensions, there are many places in the code where things must be done a bit differently. This is a, a short diagram that shows the Postgres part of Yugabyte, where you connect to a, a Postgres backend. And basically what this backend does is the rewriter and then the, the query planner and then the executor. And of course there is the optimizer to, to, to find the best plan. And the main interface with the distributed storage of Yugabyte, the main interface is in the table and access method, but they are also part of code in different places because you, you do not plan, uh, you do not optimize an execution plan in the same way when you know that data is distributed, for example. I will take other examples. So basically, Postgres has a good extensibility, but for the storage option, it is a bit limited the places where we can plug a different storage. And basically, there are two interfaces provided by Postgres when you want to store data in a different storage, either you are at the high level with the foreign data wrapper. So it's not really plugging a different storage. It's really plugging a different database. And there is a lower level that is the table and index access methods, which can be used when you want to store the Postgres table a bit differently. But this is really low level and uh, not ideal when the storage is really different as a distributed one. And for example, there were a project in um, uh, as a Postgres extension to, to plug a different storage to do zip, uh, undo like, like Oracle does. And, and the project is now dead. It was probably not very easy to plug a different uh, storage. And, and then that's the reason why in the current situation, Yugabyte, but also all the other databases that propose a, a different storage for Postgres, usually they fork it to be able to, to have hooks at different places more than the, the places that are currently there in the code. So not enough hooks for specific storage. This may change in the future. There are more and more databases trying to plug a different storage to Postgres and maybe at some point, the Postgres community will add more hooks for those, ideally the same hooks for all those projects. There is also another thing where when you build a new database, you don't want to inherit many problems that, that come from the current storage of Postgres. 
and uh, vacuum transaction ID wraparound are, are the most known issues that are encountered in production because of the, the current way Postgres is storing things. And to explain that, I, I will take an example from, um, from an article written by uh, Rick uh, Branson. It, the, the title is 10 figs I ate about Postgres, but it, it, it starts the article saying that Postgres is a really good database. It's just Postgres is really good, but there are 10 weaknesses and uh, he listed them. I will not go into the, the detail here, but uh, you see this transaction ID wrapper hand, you see the, the vacuum and, and other things. I, I, I'm saying that to, to, to say that the main weaknesses in Postgres are all located uh, at the storage level, because of course it's more difficult to change uh, things in the storage for a database that is there for, for many years and decades. And basically, if you look about the components that are concerned by that, the vacuum is really a, a problem, a source of many problems. Heap tables, basically Postgres does like Oracle does by default, stores table rows in a heap, not in the primary key, and then all indexes, including the primary key, is a secondary index. Most other databases are storing the tables within the primary key and have secondary indexes. And some problems come from there. Also, many of the problems uh, listed in this article are about high availability. This is something that we want to solve with, um, uh, with scaling out and storage. Basically saying that uh, the idea of having a fork is really to, to change uh, the storage, to add a new storage that, that can scale out without the legacy of, of the problem that comes from an existing database. So now the, 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 the real question, do, do you need to scale out? Because Postgres is quite good, has very good performance and Everybody knows that when you are a very big company, you need to scale out um, to, to, to multiple servers and even multiple regions. But for most enterprises, people just think about the performance and say, oh, everything runs on one server. I don't need to scale out. Uh, but scaling out, um, so running a database on multiple nodes, gives many benefits. The first one is availability. If you run on multiple nodes where there is replication between the nodes, then if one node is down, everything continues. If you run on a monolithic database like Postgres, uh, if the node is down, you have to fail over to a standby database. And then this takes time and this has many problems. You have to reinstate a new standby, et cetera. So high availability, uh, even if you don't have a big database, even if you don't uh, need uh, high throughput, uh, you may still want to be resilient, especially in the cloud where it can happen that the network is called for, for a few minutes between availability zones, for example. And that's for failures, but also for upgrades. Currently, if you want to upgrade the Postgres database, you have to stop the application for several minutes or hours, depending on the size and the way you do the upgrade. When you have multiple nodes that are replicated, because you can take one down and start it with the new version, then you can do rolling upgrade while the application is running. So that can be a reason. And cloud native, uh, the meaning of it is that when you deploy on the cloud, for example, if you go to AWS, you have regions with at least three availability zones, you want to benefit from this infrastructure. You have three availability zones where the latency between them is uh, low, one millisecond, and then you don't want to use them just as a standby, having all the connections, all the data processing in one availability zone and two standbys that are there just in case we need to fail over. With this kind of infrastructure, we want to distribute the load over the three availability zones. 
And also there is this idea from the cloud, if the, going to the cloud can be expensive if you go there in the same way as you did on premises, like provisioning big instances for to be sure that the peak of workloads during the year uh, will work with, with that. When you go to the cloud, you want to benefit from the elasticity. When low with low resources, most of the time, and when you have a peak of activity, can be uh, a peak in the day or a peak in the year, uh, then you want to add more compute power or more storage if it's about the volume of data. And you want uh, to separate it. You don't want to change completely a server with its storage. So that's also the idea. And uh, the extreme idea of it is to providing a serverless uh, service where when you don't use the database, you don't use any compute. Of course, the storage will be there because a database stores data persistently. Uh, but the compute, you need it only when you run query, when you connect and you run query. So if you have develop instances for developers who work only during business hours, uh, you can shut down the compute during the night. And the best is that it just starts when it is used so that you don't have to schedule in advance when it, when, uh, when it runs. So those are many reasons to, to scale out. And another one is geo distribution because uh, today you you may have an application with a database that serves users not only in one region and uh, for latency reasons, but also for for data governance, you may have uh, the need to store uh, European users in a region in Europe, U.S. users in U.S. etc. and this can be quite complex if you build different databases for that. So when you have a distributed database that can scale out where you can add multiple nodes, you can put nodes in different regions and tag the data so that it goes to the right region depending on where the users are. Okay, and also there are some people who want to go on the cloud but hybrid between multiple cloud vendors or with some nodes on premises, some nodes in the clouds. I will go, go fast on, on, on that, but do not hesitate to interrupt me if, uh, if you have questions. I'm going fast, there are more information in the slides, uh, but I also want to, to do a little uh, demo or take questions uh, at the end as you want. Basically, if we take the history of, of SQL databases, uh, and the need to scale out, uh, it started with no SQL because scaling out uh, with all SQL features and by SQL features, I mean ACID transaction, foreign keys, secondary indexes, that's not easy. So the first attempt to scale out was no SQL databases, which gets rid of many features, the data dictionary, the optimizer, foreign keys, et cetera. Uh, but can scale to multiple nodes. And then started some new databases, which realized that going to NoSQL without all those features makes the application a bit more complex because the things like transaction that the database doesn't handle, then you have to do that in the code. And the new SQL trend was to use monolithic databases, but do sharding on top of it to be able to distribute it. And a good example is Citus DB, where uh, you decide some tables are replicated on all nodes and some are sharded. But each node is still a Postgres database, which can have its standby. And, and then it becomes complex if you have multiple nodes. And there are also other database that we can also call new SQL, still using the monolithic Postgres for, for this example, but with a different storage for different purpose. So that was, for example, Aurora, where the instead of storing a data in local file, it stores it in the distributed 
disk storage across availability zones. So you still have a monolithic database, only one place where you can connect to read and write your data, but the data is replicated into multiple availability zones. And recently, Neon is starting the same idea, but open source also to provide uh, serverless applications and clone facilities and all that. And then there is distributed SQL. And that if the big difference, so those names are decided by, my, my, by marketing, uh, but the big difference is that uh, instead of taking monolithic databases and changing the storage or adding sharding on top of it, the idea is a bit the opposite, building a distributed storage and putting SQL on top of it. And the examples, uh, all the example comes from Google Spanner, uh, where Google had a lot of applications in no SQL in big tables and realized that it was quite difficult to maintain them and started to add SQL feature to a distributed uh, storage. And uh, and then CockroachDB and then YougaByteDB, where, where the decision was really to reuse Postgres. Um, so SQL on top, and th those are the, the four well-known. TIDB is more MySQL compatible. Spanner started as limited SQL, but now is going to Postgres compatibility. Cockroach is protocol compatible and some syntax, and Yugabyte really reuses Postgres. And about compatibility, it's quite important. It's easy to, to say we are Postgres compatible, but there are many levels. And I, I will put the, the, the four levels like that. The first one is using the same protocol so that people can use the same drivers. The second step is the SQL syntax being compatible, maybe with some additions. For example, when, when, when you want to distribute data on shard in Yugabyte, you, you have some keywords that can add some information about sharding, as sharding or hunt sharding, but the syntax is compatible so that an application, a SQL statement written for Postgres can run the same on Yugabyte or Aurora or whatever. Then there are features and triggers, stored procedures, all those features that are there in Postgres that maybe you don't use everywhere, but at some point you will need one of the, or, or those features. And this is really where reusing Postgres gives all those features without additional development. And then the runtime compatibility. So this is really the behavior. Even if your SQL statement runs the same on another database than Postgres, that doesn't mean that when you will have multiple users reading and waiting to the same data, that doesn't mean that you will have the same behavior with uh, concurrent access. So locking isolation level, the I in uh, ACID, uh, compatibility means having the same semantic for those isolation level than, uh, than Postgres. And another level is the extension compatibility where even if you are really similar to Postgres, do you accept all the extensions that have been built for Postgres? And then probably there are some extensions that are at the SQL level that can be accepted. And those that are at storage level, if you have a different storage, then it is different. So basically the best compatible with Postgres is Postgres itself. Uh, any other fork will have less compatibility. Even the managed services like Cloud SQL in Google and, and uh, RDS uh, Postgres in Aurora, even if they are mostly the same as Postgres, there are a few things that they have to change because it is a managed service. They cannot give super user access and all that. But the best compatible is, of course, Postgres. And then the less compatible is uh, in the distributed SQL databases is Spanner because they decided later to add Postgres compatibility, but they're working on, on that. So currently they have protocol compatibility and some syntax compatibility. So I've put that in the, in the middle of it. CockroachDB is quite the same. 
they have uh, driver compatibility, some syntax compatibility, but not all features. For example, you don't have store procedures in Cockroach. Maybe they will implement it, but that will be one by one. And that's different from, from uh, Postgres. I, I, I will explain the, the picture later. That, that's different from, uh, from Yugabyte, where because we reuse the Postgres code itself, then all those features like store procedure triggers come as is, we just have to test them to be sure. And also as the goal of Yugabyte is really to be Postgres compatible, uh, the, the runtime behavior, the locking, the isolation level are really compatible. So you can really take an application and run it without any change. Uh, this, um, this is an excerpt from a paper from Cockroach that explain the Cockroach wire level compatibility. Uh, they explained that they they use the same uh, drivers for 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 the ecosystem using the same tools, but basically it behaves differently from Postgres, and require intervention in the class client side code, so the application. Uh, for example, the isolation level. If you do not support read committed, which is the most used in uh, in Postgres, if you do not support it you can use serializable isolation level, which is really good in terms of anomalies because you have no transaction anomalies. But the problem is that you have serializable errors and then the application has to handle the retry. In Yugabyte, we provide read committed for those applications who expect that there are no serializable errors. And Going fast on how Yugabyte was built, I already mentioned that uh, it was built with a distributed storage and uh, on top of it, Postgres, basically the founders have been working in many database vendors like Oracle, but mostly also on HBase and, uh, and Cassandra at Facebook. And uh, they started on the Google Spanner paper building the distributed storage not only storage, but transaction. Basically, so what is called DogDB is a distributed key value transactional. And they started to open the Cassandra-like API, but doing more than Cassandra because fully transactional, because secondary indexes, et cetera. And of course, it was not written from, from scratch. Uh, basically, data is sharded, distributed, and each shard is uh, based on HoxDB. And the replication is done with the Raft consensus protocol to be able to replicate in sync to multiple nodes. And this was based on Apache Kudu. And then uh, a few years later was plugged the Postgres, the, the SQL API using Postgres. So taking the Postgres code, forking it, changing what must be changed and plugging uh, so that instead of storing locally in local file, the Postgres code co um, calls the DocDB APIs to store in this distributed engine. So basically, Yugabyte is deployed on multiple nodes. Each node has a DocDB node with part of the data, but has also a Postgres endpoint which is a stateless Postgres. Everything that has a state that must be persisted goes to the uh, DocDB layer. And the picture about it, so the, the marketing side of it, the user side of it is having one logical database with all SQL features, but behind multiple nodes storing it and uh, replicated and, and in sync with the, the Raft protocol and being able to distribute that across multiple regions if that is the need. And the architecture of it, this is the DocDB, so the distributed uh, transactional storage layer doing automatic sharding. So based on the primary key of the table or the indexed colons, this is automatically distributed, there is load balancing to be sure that all nodes do the same work, 
and uh, have the same odd data of the O spots, odd spots, and transaction across it. So some transaction, most of SQL transaction will update a table, check a foreign key, uh, update secondary indexes, and those are in multiple nodes. So distributed transactions are managed there and the raft protocol. And on top of it, Postgres is just one API on top of it. I mentioned that there is also a Cassandra-like API and maybe one day another one, why not? If there is a need for it, uh, it can be uh, MySQL, it can be anything, but currently the Postgres API is the, the most popular. And the idea is that this distributed storage is just nodes started on VMs or containers anywhere. And you can have nodes in different uh, cloud vendors on premises, etc. And the Postgres application, the, the application written for, for Postgres using the Postgres driver connects to the Postgres endpoint in each. Okay, now if, if we want to look more about where in where in the Postgres code uh, this storage is plugged. So the best is to look at it because Yugabyte is fully open source like Postgres. And if you search in the Postgres code, you will see a sub directory, which is the Postgres fork. And in this directory, you can search for is YB relation, a relation in Postgres is a table or an index. And if it's a Yugabyte one, so a distributed one, then things may be done differently. And usually you will see this hook with a if is YB relation calling a different code than Postgres. For example, here we are on the table scan, scanning a heap table. And, and here you see how Postgres really think that all tables are heap table. Actually, Yugabyte uh, tables are not heap tables, but in the scan, we call a different uh, function. And the different function is in different files uh, where there is a YB scan and YB um, LSM, I, I, I will explain quickly. We don't store tables in heap tables and indexes in B trees. We store everything in LSM uh, trees. I will explain a bit more about it or we will see if we have a question, but I will go fast on that there. But this is different places in the code where we have different storage to scan, to read, but also to modify data. And those call the distributed storage. If you want to see it when it is executed, this is a flame graph showing the different stack. Uh, let me just put it here if I can download it. So the flame graph basically shows all the different call stacks in my system. I focus on D1 from the Postgres uh, endpoint, and I've put some colors to show what comes from the Postgres code itself and what has been added by Yugabyte. Basically in Postgres, when you connect, you are there, you are in, a, in the Postmaster, and there are a few things where Yugabyte does something differently, but the, the big one, uh, here is a wrapper where the idea of it is that when you are in the distributed system, uh, because of clock skew, the different clocks between the servers, there are some cases where you cannot guarantee consistency and then you have to read again at a different read point. I, I will not go into the details, but basically that's something that you don't have with a monolithic database. And then Postgres doesn't have to handle it, but in a distributed system, there are some places where you have to restart it. And instead of sending a serializable error to the client so that the application restarts it, uh, the code itself can do it in some cases. So this is an example where Yugabyte adds some code. If something can be restarted automatically, then it will be started automatically. And then 
the executor code from mostly Postgres. And at some point, for example, this is the, uh, the insert, then it calls the Yugabyte code that will uh, build the buffer to send to the different tablet servers to distribute the data. So I will not go again too much into the details. Tell me if you have questions about that. I will either answer some questions or do a demo or do the same at the same time. A bit more about the raft consensus and LSM tree. Uh, so the Postgres layer sends operations to this distributed transactional key value data store that is called uh, DocDB. And basically those are the new values. So either you read for a key, the primary key or the index key, or you update some colon values. And uh, there you have the new value and it must be timestamped to order the, the, the transaction operations. And there is a logical clock that is a clock consistent in the whole cluster. And this goes to the raft protocol because you don't want to write only in one place. It goes to one, if you update one row, it goes to one shard, but this shard will be replicated. So the shard, we call them tablet and it is replicated to multiple tablet peers. And uh, this is a raft group where you have a leader and follower and the, the raft protocol will guarantee the atomicity of this writing in different places. And it is stored in a LSM tree, log structure uh, merge tree, where we just add uh, new values uh, quite similar to Postgres, but in a different format so that we can do MVCC multi-versioning. And the, the most interesting thing is that this LSM tree, different from the battery, is append only. And first it goes into memory. And when the memory is full for a tablet, it can be about 100 megabytes when you insert or change, it's full. And then the memory is flushed to a file SST file, and this file then is immutable. So you accumulate files with the versions of your rows or colon values, and at some point you accumulate them, and you have some kind of garbage collection, but very lower level than vacuum, so without locking anything in the background, that will compact them to remove the intermediate versions. Okay, then let's go for a demo. And the idea of the demo is to run on Docker. I have Docker on my laptop here, and I will run the command data in the slide. Basically, I have a distributed database. I start one node, but my goal is to have um, to be resilient and then have multiple nodes. So replication factor three, I need at least three nodes. And here, I'm just starting them. You see the different containers. And I'm nearly running the same thing. The only difference is that the second one and the first one joins the first one. So the YB0 is the first one. And I join them. So, so that we are in the same cluster. I can see that from um from docker and we also have a web console uh, sorry localhost so the the web console on localhost why localhost because i forwarded the port of this web console to my uh, to my laptop so here I can see the three nodes for the master. I will not go into the detail. The most important are the tablet servers. I have three nodes that can run queries and store data. And for the moment, I have no data in them. I will add data. And because it is Postgres compatible, I just connect. So I also forwarded the port 5433 here. I can connect with 
Postgres client, PSQL, and we have some additional functions, for example, one that shows the different nodes when you are connected, it's quite convenient. And if I want to see where I'm connected, I'm connected to one node here, I'm connected to YB0. And I can connect to another one because I forwarded the port to different port on my uh, local laptop. I connect to another node. I can see the listener address is another node. So that's the idea. I see it as a whole database, but I can connect to any node and this distributes the connection and then the memory used by the connection and the CPU. Now let's create quickly a table. So I create a table with a UID. This is why I use the Postgres extension PG Crypto. I create a gene index to show that everything you have in Postgres is, uh, is possible. And I will insert some data. This insert inserts a UID and the text that tells me where I was connected when I inserted it. So here I was connected on YB1. If I connect uh, on another one, for example, and I insert YB2, um, I will connect to the first one I tunneled. I think if it was this one, I insert. OK, so YB0. And now if I select from my table, so I connected to different places, inserted a row, and finally, I can query it and I see all rows because logically it is only one database. It's not like the shorted database where you are in different places. So I can query it and query it in one transaction. This is a, this is a, a transaction. And now I will run this kind of insert in a loop, inserting new rows uh, to show you the activity we have. So if I refresh the tablet server list, first I can see that I'm using some storage there and I can see reads and write operations. I'm doing only inserts, those are write operations. Even if insert has to read some data, those operations are the operation between the Postgres layer and the distributed storage. And here we write. I refresh and you see that I'm writing. And quickly, I will show you the most important there. So yeah, must also show you that this table demo has multiple uh, tablets. Those are the shards based on uh, hash on the primary key. So a row can go to a different shard. And this is the raft group where there is a leader and followers. When you read and write, you go to the leader, but it is distributed because some rows have their leader in YB1, some rows have their leader in YB0 and YB2, okay? And now what I want to show you, so let me just show the application running and I will just stop one node there. And you can see that here, my application is waiting. Because I stopped it, there were some leaders in this node. So the first thing that Sugabyte does when it detects that the node is down is elect a new leader uh, in the other nodes. And then there is also a TCP timeout that is config uh, configurable. Here you have seen 15 seconds uh, where the application was just waiting to get connected to the right leader. Uh, but waiting, nothing failed, no error message. This is much faster than um, failover to a standby database where all connections have to be initiated. And if I look at, so here, if I refresh the list of tablets, you can see, so I stopped the YB2 you can see that I still have some tablet peers there, but only followers because the node is down. All the leaders were re-elected in the available nodes. And 
Rust protocol basically waits for the quorum. So you can write to the leader in YB1, get acknowledgement from YB0. And even if YB2 is not answering, everything continues. And now if I just start it back, so I'm simulating an availability zone uh, failure for a few minutes, for example. So quickly, the node is back. We'll catch up the, the latest changes. And we will see quickly that it will even elect new leaders on it. So not yet the case. But if I refresh, I expect that Yugabyte automatically has rebalanced the leader to go uh, on YB2. Not the case yet, but that will come. Just checking that the application is still running. When you scale out, there is no problem. And we will see that YB2 will take, of course, it's a bit longer when starting a container. Actually, I wanted to pause it rather than start it, but here it has to start and then we will see it running. And the, yeah, so I can see writes everywhere. Then I guess that some followers in YB2 have been elected as leader. Yeah, for example, this one. So that's the cloud native part of Yugabyte, uh, you do you have operations or failures out cloud at cloud level without any operation in the database. The data, uh, the the application continues. The data is still available, and the load is rebalanced. And I will quickly um, show the scale out of it, and then see if there are some questions. So let me just open another terminal so that we can still see the application running. So here in a loop, I'm starting uh, three more nodes, three, four, and five. So they are starting and I will see them. So you can still see the application running, of course. And if I look at the tablet servers, you see that those new nodes were detected, so YB uh, 5, 4, and 3. And at some point, they will take also read and write. So here I'm simulating the case where I'm running low because I don't have a lot of activity on my application on my database. And then there is a peak of activity because it is Black Friday or because uh, uh, the, the, the customer care uh, sends or some mailing to, to the users and they all connect. I see that the, the activity is increasing. Then I quickly double the size of my cluster, adding more nodes. And if I refresh, I can see right operations on all nodes, including the new ones. How is it possible? If I look at the tablets, I can see that those new nodes, so YB uh, 5, 4, and 3, those new nodes now have some followers and even leaders. So that's automated by the database. A new node is detected, then automatically a new follower will be created on it to be able to rebalance the data. And when you have followers rebalanced, then some of them will be elected as leader because the leader is doing more work. This is where the reads and writes are happening, and you want to balance that as well. Okay, so basically the two things that that was uh, were there were uh, the possibility when you are in replication factor three to have one node down if it is across three availability zones one availability zone down if it is across three regions one region down and the application continues just hangs a few seconds for for uh, for the leader election if it has to read and write from this leader. Okay, uh, so if you want to test it, that's quite easy. If you have Docker, of course, there is documentation about uh, everything to run it, but you can run a free node cluster and play with it, stopping nodes as you want and connecting to it just with a Postgres application. You can connect with DBEaver, you can connect with anything Postgres. 
Okay, we are nearly uh, after one hour. I don't see any questions. Actually, I don't see a lot of people. So probably most people will um, see the recording of it. Uh, let me just summarize quickly what we have seen. The reasons for a distributed SQL database can be Yugabyte or anything. Uh, scale out for elas elasticity and resilience to failures. The reason for Postgres compatibility, um, no need to learn a new database, a new syntax, and benefit from the ecosystems of tools or knowledge based. based. And the reason for a fork, rather than implementing new features, are just benefiting from all the Postgres features immediately with the best compatibility and same behavior so that you can build a new application that can run on Yugabyte or Postgres but also use an application that has been built to run our own Postgres and test it or run it in production uh, on Yugabyte. And the main difference with Postgres, because it's not equal to Postgres, the main difference is that uh, you have to think a bit more about the data model. It, always think about the data model, but if something is not optimal in a single node server, then it will be worse in a, in a distributed database. So think about the primary key, how you hash it or range it, uh, or, or short it by range. And uh, think also about the new access pattern. The index only scan is very efficient in Yugabyte. Uh, more than Postgres, we have keep scan. So there are also more possibilities, even if the same queries run, you may think about the things that uh, are added uh, for performance in Yugabyte. And don't worry anymore about vacuum. The, the garbage collection of, of the, the SST file is completely different, different level, no consequence in the you know, transactions ID and, and locking. And uh, when it can be an alternative to Postgres, it's not for everything. Uh, mostly OLTP. Currently, it's mostly optimized for OLTP. There are some analytic pushdowns, and there will be more, but there are some complex query group by that will have to get all data and aggregate them by the Postgres layer until all that is pushed down. So for the moment, not for data warehouses, more OLTP and the analytics that you do in OLTP. Uh, cloud native environment everywhere, VMs, container, etc. And uh, multi-tenant also because you, you have no, you, you can scale and you can also dedicate some nodes to some data, to some partitions and geo distribution when you want to run a database with users everywhere. Okay, so we are after one hour. Uh, thank you very much for for being there. If you have questions later when watching the recording, uh, do not hesitate to contact me. I'm developer advocate, so my goal is uh, to, to, to let you know about Yugabyte, answer your question, also get your feedback if you use it, if you test it. I'm interested to know what works and what doesn't work. Okay, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Um, we haven't gotten any questions in, but we do have a comment that says, great session, thank you. Um, thank you. And I think that sums it up really nicely. So uh, again, Frank, thank you so much for your time and the thought that you put into this. Um, to our attendees, thank you for spending a little bit of your day with us. Um, and I hope to see you at future Postgres World webinars. Have a good one, sure. y'all. Bye. Bye-bye.